right. Well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today, I'm joined by actor Patrick Gallagher, famous for his work as Attila the Hun in the Night of the Museum films, Ken Tanaka in Glee, and his current role as Sheriff Walter Tubb on the show Big Sky. In addition to this, Patrick has also played roles in many other popular films, TV shows, and video games. So, Patrick, thanks for coming on. How you doing? Good, good. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. I'm also playing another sheriff called Sheriff Barnum in a show called Joe Pickett, which is written by the same author that wrote the books that Big Sky is based on. Oh, wow. So somehow okay. I become I become small town American sheriff. You are the that's right. You're the so, go to sheriff now. So yeah, for C I'm CJ Box's sheriff, which is a nice place to be. So <laughs> cool. All right. And so when did you first get interested in acting? Well, I think I've always kind of been interested. And in my father was a Shakespeare Chaucer professor. Uh, my mother was a piano player, so we've always had arts around. Um, I got, especially for my dad, my dad was interesting because he was an actor and a scholar. So I think one of his big last projects he did was traveling around to all of the Shakespeare festivals and trying to marry Shakespeare as a, as an academic entity with Shakespeare as a theatrical entity, because they are two separate things, right? you know? And so he went to the, his whole thing was to try to, you know, bring the two together and sort of examine that. So, you know, I, I've always been interested in it. My first play was, in Chilliwack, BC, I was a chorus in The Music Man, then got in a car accident and couldn't do it. Oh my gosh. Um, Jeez. Yeah. And then I have a really highly educated family. I think out of both sides, three generations, there's something like seven PhDs, 11 master's degrees, and 22 bachelor's yeah. degrees. And so I felt pressure to go to school. So I went to theater school. <laughs> okay. And yeah. that was it. So I'm the only person without a degree in my entire family, both sides, three generations. <laughs> Well, someone's got to break the streak, so and, and do something. Yeah, like, mix it up. But I'm I, I'm half Chinese, so there was you know there was a lot of you know that there was a lot of expectations of of getting one of those. But luckily, yeah. you know, my grandma came around at some point. So right. So was your dad an actor in, in like theater, or was it like film or TV? Or he did he did a lot of theater. Um, he did some film and television in, in Vancouver when it the industry first got started. Yeah. Um, he did some commercials. I mean, this was when I was really young. So I, you know, I just thought it was kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he, he did, he did produce some Shakespeare with a friend of his named Dermot Henley. He would produce plays in the small town. We grew up in Chilliwack in that area. So yeah, it was, I was kind of always around. It. Okay. So did you like feel from a young age then that like, Oh, I want to go into acting and, and do stuff like that. Like my dad did or. I mean, I don't know if it was that conscious, but in hindsight, I think, yeah, I think I was always sort of headed in that direction. The only other thing I wanted to be really strongly was a journalist. Okay. Um, I used to walk around going, this is Patrick Gallagher, CBC News, Lebanon, because I thought that, yeah. you know, I, that stuff still fascinates me. Um, sure. Then I realized how much work it was. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I think I've, it's always been something, I mean, let's be honest, I think part of it was always where I would be seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think any actor that says I don't do it because they, you know, we all, we all know we're going to get seen. So I think there's an element of that. Yeah. I just wanted something that was different and exciting, you know? Yeah. You know, like my yeah. worst nightmare would, for me personally, would be going to the same place every day, you know? So I feel very fortunate that I can make a living at something that I really enjoy, you know? Yeah, I mean, definitely. That's, that's everyone, that's, that's everyone's goal, I guess. Sure. Yeah. It makes total sense. Well, so was there a particular point in time then that you started to realize like, okay, I can go pro and, um, you know, do this for the rest of my life. Yeah, I did it. I did take theater in, in high school in Chillock, BC in the eighties with the Mohawk. So I was a punk rocker in a small town. Okay. Nice. Which nice. was kind of fun back then. <laughs> um, and then, like I said, I did get out of high school and I mean, not to get too personal, but you know, the parents had a divorce. My grades went from A's and B's to barely graduate. Right. You know, I think, you know, in hindsight, it's, it seems natural. So I did go to a community college. You know, I went into sociology and political science and took that a little bit and just, you know, didn't really do well. Okay. And honestly, I went to a place called Douglas College just so I could say I'm going to a college and got in a theater program. Then at the end of that, there's a place called the National Theater School of Canada, which you know, auditions at that time, I think 600 people a year and takes 12. And I just kind yes. of went for it. And, you know, I think fate came in and I got in there. And once I got in there, 
that's when I started thinking this is a career because that, yeah. that beca- you know, I mean, that whole school is a conservatory. So it's, right. it's, it's just theater. And that's when I started thinking it. You know, I, went, I was in class with Sandro, so we had a very good class. Okay, class wow. Three, so yeah, yeah. yeah and so I think that's when it—that's when it becomes a reality. Is yeah. when when you're in that environment in Montreal, which is an incredible art city, mm-hmm. especially for an anglophone Canadian. Sure, sure. Then you kind of go, okay, this is something that is a possibility. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we get that get to that level that you know, okay, it's just one more step, and I can make it. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to quit actually. I mean, I you know, I graduated wow. in '93. Um, I spent, you know, I worked it a little bit enough that, you know, kept the juices flowing from like 93 to 2000. I did some theater and a lot of television, but not enough to actually make a living at it. So I left Toronto in 2000 to go to New York, um, to sort of follow that dream. And then I was doing a play that toured the country and I said, I wasn't going to do it again. And they called me and said, we need you. So I thought, okay, I'll just go. I'll, I need some money. I'll go do this play one more time and go back to New York. And then 9-11 happened. So I stayed in Vancouver and just sort of late nine, you know, in, in early 2000, I started having that thing of, you know, it's been seven years. I'm still working a regular job. I just need one job, that one sort of big job. And then I think I can make a living at it. And somehow got master and commander, you know, yeah. literally, like two weeks after having that conversation in my head. Yeah. So I punched my last time clock at the white spot on Cardero in Vancouver, which is now closed on Mother's Day of 2002. That was the wow. last time I had to punch a time card. So I've been very, very fortunate. Yeah. That's so, I mean, geez, what was your, uh, so how did you get into the role in a uh, master and commander? Cause I remember that film when it came out, I was really cool. You know, movie. Honestly, I remember getting, they call them breakdowns. I don't know if I should do, I, should I explain this? Yeah, no, this I, I mean, I think most people would be interested because it's not something well known across people, not in the community. Okay, so so, so, so what happens, you get, an, you, get a, you get an agent and then they get what's called a breakdown from the casting services, which breaks down all the roles and breaks okay. down a general sense of what they're looking for and a general description. So I got the breakdown for Awkward Davies and it said 1805 Welsh, British Navy. And my first thought was, are you people freaking crazy? I mean, <laughs> look at my face. And then I thought, you know what? It's Peter Weir. It's Russell Crowe. This is ridiculously impossible, but you never know. I'll just go in and do as good an audition as I can. Maybe they'll remember yeah. something else. And it wasn't even lines. It was just being interviewed by a casting director, just asking questions. And somehow I got it. And that changed everything for me then i started to realize that i'm not going to worry about what they put in the breakdowns because that's just a general impression i'm simply going to go in and do the best job i can yeah and so yeah i still don't know how i got it to this day i asked peter weir once and I, there was one question he said that you know he said that he knows fairly quickly and it's an essence you know he said he i think he said something like for him directing is 90 percent casting you know you cast it right and then the actor does their thing Right. But right. I think they asked, I was supposed to play, like they described him as like a Harley Davidson, it'd be like a biker equivalent of that time. I think there was a question, are you afraid of anything? And I said, no. And then I think they asked me a question, what about God? And apparently I paused and I went, God and I have an understanding. And he liked that answer. Something like that. It was a long time ago. But that yeah. changed a lot for me because, you know, that's when I realized that you know, there's nothing I can do about what they are looking for. All I can do about is what I have to offer. And, you know, I think casting is not anything to do with talent. I mean, I think once you're there, they, they, they assume you can act. It comes down to who we are. And that's, I started working. I realized it's just, they're hiring our essence. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, I'm sure your reaction when you got, you know, told like, Hey, you're going to get this part was you're probably like, Whoa. Okay. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was, it was, I'm like, what? And then I'm like, well, shit, now I'm scared. I mean, yeah, this is Russell right. Crowe, Peter Weir. What am I going to do? I show up and all these British guys are going, what's this Canadian guy doing here? Then I had to do a Welsh accent, which they were, you know, at, in the contract, they could change. One of my proudest moments is I, I got it past the Brits. And we went to the premiere in yeah. London and they were going, I can't believe you're not Welsh. I'm like, thank you. Oh my gosh. That's- and it was different. It was different on set because on set there were three Welsh guys. I don't know if you know much about the Welsh accent. There's... I think three different accents. So I would just say, say yeah. to my ear, say to my ear, say to my ear. And I'd do it. And then you come back and they do ADR, which is additional dialogue recording the looping eight months later. And I'm going, well, are you flying them into Vancouver so they can whisper in my ear? I mean, how are we going to do this? 
I had to do it on my own and they still kept it. And Peter was great. He said, listen, you know, your accent is good. And you have to remember these guys were on the ships for 20 years. So the accents are going to modify. Yeah. yeah. But, my, but my proudest moment was getting to pass the Brits. Yeah. I mean, that's, I just, you know, that's one of the incredible things about actors in general is the ability to just mimic an accent and pull it off to the point where viewers, you know, that are native in that accent, you know, don't know that you're not native. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was hard. I mean, it, Welsh is not an easy... Look, I didn't have a lot of lines, but, yeah. you know, I, I did want to nail them. And it, and it's such a delicate accent. that can go into Scottish sure. or South Asian so easily. Yeah. You know, and there's different and there's different Welsh accents. And I just sort of picked <laughs> one and <laughs> went like this. Yeah. So <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, later on in your career, then you would... I guess several years later, you would get that role with Ninth Museum. How did you get into that role? Uh, that was an interesting one, too. I was in Vancouver, and I got the breakdown. And originally, the character spoke English. So I believe the lines were, he was playing Doom, and his lines were something like, I was heavier then. I was like 260. I'm about 215 now. So okay. I was big. And I think the lines were, Doom, go get me two copies now. And I did the initial audition and I got a call back in front of director Sean Levy and we were in Vancouver and I did it. <sighs> Do I remember this correctly? He said something like, okay, that was really good. Um, but we're considering like changing this character a little bit where he's not going to speak English and it's hard to explain. And I said, you want evil Asian dictator circa 1250 gibberish? He goes, yes. And I just literally blew it out my ass. And I got that job. I couldn't believe I got that job. I think I was the last person hired. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, and, and I think I owe a lot to Sean. I think there was something about what I – I think they'd hired enough stars yeah. that he kind of thought, you know what, we can take a flyer on some unknown people. You know, I'd heard, like, okay. Goldberg was up for it and you oh know, Ken Watanabe, and maybe they said no. Wow, okay. that's a um, And then I went, okay, now I've got to do this jam job and make this language up, and I just made it up as we went along. And he was great. <laughs> I mean, Ben was great, was really supportive. Um yeah. I remember they had it written and I would just, I mean, I was so naive. I actually wanted to listen to Mongolian to find out whether it sounded more like Japanese or Chinese. Yeah. And so then I would get Mongolian words and throw them into things. And I did, I, so I did do work on it because I didn't, I want to know if it was more tonal, like, like Mandarin or Cantonese or more kind of word based. Sure. Like Korean or Japanese. And it ended up being more like a second. And then I would just, start having fun with it. I mean, there's Krispy Kremes in there. I would say Krispy Kreme or ask people where their grandmother was born and in Czechoslovakia. And if their town was Bakla, I'd say Bakla. <laughs> so there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, I'm not going to tell you where it is, but there's a flat out nice little set of swear words in there somewhere. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, I imagine being able to sort of create that character with, and because I mean, it seems like obviously you you had to kind of wing it for a lot of the. We did, and a lot of and the way Sean works and Ben works, I'd say thirty percent of that movie was winged. I mean, that part just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and, yeah. and that was that was a lot of me having to sort of get over my fear. I remember having to get over my fear because I'm going whoa. I mean, look where I am. And, and your first thought is, I can't go with Ben Stiller and, and, and Robin Williams and Ricky Gervais. Right. I mean, what am I doing here? And then you've got to realize that our job is to overcome our fear. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's what talent really is. Sure. You know, I have this little phrase that we have six jobs, which is show up on time, know our lines, hit our marks, make sure someone knows where we are at all times, hang up your damn costumes. That's one I added. But also to not let fear shut us down. Because yeah. it's all about ideas and, and, and going with your instincts. And so, you know, they, they were really supportive and I just got over and then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. I remember he said, we're going to do the magic scene. I said, what are we going to do? He says, don't worry about it. We'll just show up and you'll figure something out. And I'm like, that's where this came. I mean, Maggie Sosa was a rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. And I saw the look on his face and that's when I went, okay. And I remember Robin was really helpful. He was such an amazing guy because he could tell that I was nervous. And I did something one day and he just walked by and said, that was really funny. Knowing that I go, if Robin Williams thinks it's funny, then I must be doing okay. And I, I right. know for a fact he did it on purpose. Yeah. Because once he said it's funny, then I'm like, I felt, okay, I'm doing something right here. So yeah, that was I mean, an amazing I, experience. Yeah, definitely. I, I can only imagine. I mean, 
the the cast there was pretty loaded with with talent oh and uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of insane actually to go back through the credits and see all the people in that movie um and uh yeah i mean that just shows also though you know how good of a role you were able to play and, and to be involved in that and have a critical role i mean i think a lot of people remember your part very well from the film because it sticks out you know the, well, thanks <laughs> i'm pretty proud of that it's you know cool... and it's so funny it's so funny because i remember just thinking just call cut so i could just watch these guys interact with each other in between yeah you know just to watch all these comedians just like just say sure. some of the funniest shit i've ever heard in my life yeah, yeah i was yeah. really that was really that was a big that was a kind of a game changer for me that one yeah, yeah I, I i bet i mean and then you get to you know two more movies after that because the series would continue you get a couple more films in and uh that's really cool. yeah yeah and you know there's 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 skills involved. I mean, to do a big movie like that is a very different experience to do on television. I mean, I hope every actor gets a chance to experience something on that scale, you yeah. know, that's quote unquote a blockbuster. There's just so many resources. The talent is so great. Um, you've got time. Yeah. You know, television is really fast. And so I remember coming out of that film and doing TV. I'm like, what do you mean? We're like, whoa, lighting change used to mean 45 minutes. Now it means, to, okay, I'm, I'm back, you know, yeah. and, and this, it is, you know, it's, it, it, there's a lot of, it's not just instinct. I mean, I think there's a lot of skill to being in the business and that's, that's what takes time sure. to learn. Yeah. So. That makes total sense. Do you have a favorite uh, like role that you played in film or television or? Well, it depends. I mean, Attila always has a special place in my heart and it sure. was always so much fun. I mean, it was oh, just yeah. fun. I mean, I just made Definitely. it up. Honestly, one of my, weirdly, one of my favorite roles was um, in Men of a Certain Age playing the mechanic Jesse. Okay. Um, and Ken Tanaka, partially because I got to play aspects of myself that I don't necessarily like, which was desperate, empathetic, and cynical, and, <laughs> and, um, and angry. And you get to play all of those parts on those two characters. And that's, that's yeah. part of what the fun was. Yeah. You know, Ken Tanaka was more like me than I care to actually admit at the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know um you know you tap into parts of you that understand that kind of desperation and loneliness and and then i got men of a certain age after i got fired off of glee which i think is you know the proper term i mean just okay. i'm not going to go into it but i just didn't i didn't know what i was doing back then so i made some bad choices in terms of okay. the business um but i remember i auditioned for it and i was supposed to play this cynical kind of angry kind of just chip on a shoulder uh, mechanic and their production offices were right above the glee production offices and this is like three days after i lost that job and oh I, realized my. I was literally I, I realized i was literally right on top and i'm like i don't have to do anything yeah and i just used it but that job was really fun because again i beyond that it was andre brower and um Scott Bakula and Ray Romano and, and Mike Royce had written it and we would do read throughs, which is really, really helpful. And then you yeah. just get on set and there was just a lot of freedom and there was a lot of trust and there was a lot of talent you got to work with. And that's when it's always fun. I mean, it's always fun. That's, I think one of the things you need to work is I don't understand why people are unhappy. I mean, look what we get to do. You know, yeah. you have to find this balance between realizing what a privilege it is, but you know, there's, within the business, there's also certain business things we need to go. We have self-worth and money and all that stuff like that. But yeah. ultimately, um, you know, I always try to keep that sense of privilege and enthusiasm. You know, every day that I'm on set, I take a moment to go, wow, I mean, look what I get to do. Because yeah. so many people don't get a chance to. You yeah, know? definitely. And I'm not, and I, I kind of got a period where I got a little bit, not embarrassed, but I realized that I, I wouldn't be as honest about how much I loved it as, as I really did. And I go, well, it's the enthusiasm that I think is essential. That's what people want to work with people that are enthusiastic and, and happy. And I have no bones now about saying, I love it. I mean, I really do. I, I would rather be on set than be anywhere else. Yeah. You know, and it's fun. Yeah. And as definitely. long as it's fun, it's fun. And they, you know, I don't have to ask anybody if they want fries <laughs> right. or hamburger. Right. I, mean, I don't have to clean anything up, which is my I, the thing I hate more than anything else. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Because 
you know, everyone's going through their lives trying to figure out what they want to do. Once they find what they want to do, you know, the goal is to get there. Um, and there's a lot yeah. of people that never do uh, for, you know, various jobs that they're interested in. So being able to get there and also just appreciating that you're there in that moment um, and being able to enjoy it. I mean, that's just kind of what, you know, the dream is, you know, to live a life like that. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think people who don't get there, sometimes it's a choice. Yeah. You know, sometimes they don't have an option and, you know, that's really hard. Sure. Um, I, I feel really fortunate, but at the same t time, also, I knew that I chose to try to do it. And so I'm proud yeah. of that as well, you yeah. know? Um, so yeah, I feel really, really, really lucky, especially to make a living at it, you know, since God, it's, it's uh, 20 years in May that I've made a living that's, at it. That's incredible. That's Congratulations. Crazy. Yeah. Thank you. I just realized, holy shit, I'm old. May 7th, 2000 and two was i think my last shift at the white spot Jeez. wow i'm old everything hurts now everything all of a sudden all my joints hurt it's all psychosomatic but yep, that's i don't like it part of life i guess yeah yeah now is so. it a challenge being like a when you first get into the industry as a young actor trying to like once you get like sort of a break is there a lot of pressure then to kind of stay relevant and keep getting new you know, spots in films or TV shows, is there always a fear in the back of your head? Like, you know, I could lose this any moment and, you know. Um... Yeah, I think there always is. And, you know, there's different categories too. I mean, for someone like Sander who hit big and becomes a star, there's, I think there's more pressure to try to not lose that. Right. You know, for someone like me that was a character actor, you, you always wonder, am I going to work again? Uh, and, and can I sustain it? Um, I got some really good advice, um, you know, where they try to explain to us that that's going to come and go. Yeah. You know, the fame is fun. All the perks of it are fun. And you enjoy it while you've got it, but realize that that's not real. Right. You know, right. Um, like my family doesn't think I'm famous. I'm like, well, <laughs> right. why do I have to do my own laundry? I don't have to, you know, <laughs> right. people should be bringing me my, where's, so no one's bringing me my food. That's right. Yeah. You know, and so if you can stay humble in that sense, and, and I think, yeah, you always worry about it, but I think you need to find a time and a place to think about it. I don't think you, I learned to not worry about it. It's there. Yeah. But then you need to try to make a plan and go, well, how am I going to do this? You know, rather than going, oh my God, I can't lose it, you go, okay, well, I'm going to stay, I'm going to be in the present and I'm yeah. just do the best work I can, treat people as best I can. You know, you talk to your, your people. We all say our people, our teams, which are agents and managers and sort of, you know, then try to figure out a way to, to, to sustain whatever it is you want or decide you want to do something different, yeah. which is another option. But I think the key is to be aware of it, but to not worry about it. Um, right. And to, for me personally, that was finally being in the present and not thinking about the future. Yeah. Or the past. I mean, I've made some mistakes. We all have. Sure. So, you know, you have to learn to look back without regret. You need to learn to look back with some kind of um, clarity and honesty with yourself and go, what did I do wrong? And, and don't make that mistake again. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I sort of live my life with my gut. And this whole job I do mostly is just living with your gut. So, I had to then learn to, to use this and realize right. that there's part of the business that is just analytical yeah. for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, so, so that, that was just it for me personally, but yeah, I think it's always there. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing is you need to be satisfied. I have a friend who, you know, I used to be like this too, where he's never happy with what he's doing. I said, well, you know, there's always more in this business. Sure. You, know, you don't want to get to the point where you win a SAG award. You're not happy because it's not a Golden Globe. You win a Golden Globe and you're unhappy because it's not an Oscar. Then you win an Oscar, but you're unhappy because it's only right. an actor. Right. You know, I mean, this is, in some weird way, this is, there's no ceiling in this business. And sure. you, which is a great thing, but you also need to go, you need to be where you are. That was yeah. the key for me, is to be yeah. in the present. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that even, you know, people outside the acting industry can relate to in general. Like if you have, if you're passionate about anything and you're working a job, you're always going to want to continue to improve or make more yeah. money and do something. Um, but there's got to be that balance of enjoying, you know, where you are and be thankful for where you are, but also still having the ambition to keep going and do more. Uh, yeah. And I think for us, where it's such a, an, an element of fame and, and fortune that, 
you know, that advancement can't just be about, I want to make more money or be more famous. You know, right. I, I, I try to say, well, how do, how can I become better? And add that to it. I mean, let's, yeah. let's be honest. We want more money. We want more fame, but it can't yeah. be just about that. Yeah. It really is a job yep. that, that I enjoy immensely. And so, you know, if you focus on doing that job as best you can and going, well, how can I do a better job next time? I think that other stuff takes care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. To a that point, makes sense. You know, so. Yeah. So how has acting changed over the course of your career then? Oh, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> back when I started, we used to have to get on the bus and go to our agent's offices and get the breakdowns that they would leave outside their offices at the end of the day. Okay. <laughs> wow. And we'd literally, yeah. And so you can get, and what we have as sides would be our audition scenes. So they give us sides, which is like some of the scenes. Um, and you, uh, so we'd have to go to our agent's office and get it. That was in the early 90s. <clears throat> then fax machines came like woo you can fax it to me which is great and so then we wouldn't have to go down there anymore um it used to be black and white photos we used to use not just we used to be like actual hard copy eight by tens when i started and they wanted black and white for some reason they didn't yeah. want color which i never understood because you're supposed to be seeing us then it went to color we have something called a reel which is sort of a like our resume, like samples of scenes we've done. Right. That was, that was on DVD. That was on VHS when I started. Okay. <laughs> then you put it on DVD and now it's all digital. Yeah. You know, it's all digital. Um, so yeah, that's, there's been a lot. God, I didn't realize there's been a lot of changes. I mean, I was there when we had to go to our agent's office and go get the sides and, and everything yeah. was smaller. So you had more time. I mean, there's so much going on now that, um, I mean, it's changed a lot in the last, just in the last two years and even in the last five years. But yeah, those are some of the major changes. Um, the fax machine was big. Even, I mean, even the answering machine to be able to call it. I had a pager when I was in New York City because we didn't have cell phones, really. I mean, cell phones sure. were hard to have. So I would have a right. pager, like a drug dealer going, we're going to make a call. <laughs> you know, and you call in your, and you call in your answer, you call a pay phone to get back to your answering machine because you can remotely get the message from your agent about what the audition is for. And you're like, I loved, I remember being in Toronto going, doing that exact thing. Got a page, got on a pay phone, called my answering machine, got my message remotely and going, wow, technology. Great. Right. Great. <laughs> That's you know? Yeah. That technology just continues to change every aspect, it seems like, of society. Yeah. And doesn't yeah. stop so but there's also been changes within i mean the, even when i started there were still television actors and film actors you know and and the, the those would be two separate things which has yeah. thankfully luckily gone away um there would be um people that would nobody would ever do commercials if you did a, big stars wouldn't do commercials i mean it's had advantages disadvantages that everybody's doing everything now i mean with yeah. the streaming services so much quality can be put into um, limited series and you know the flip side of that is a lot of the money goes to people at the top and it's harder for people getting started to get a piece of that pie right you know right. and i don't begrudge the people up there i mean it's part of our job is to say you know if we want to i don't want to get too into the business part but you know we've got to kind of go well this is the money that's in there how much of this am i entitled to what can i get yeah when you've got huge stars coming taking a whole shitload of it it makes it harder yeah definitely. but at the same token it also has brought given us a chance to do these amazing projects and work with these amazing people so it's given more opportunity and weirdly less opportunity in some ways as well but generally more opportunity i mean yeah. you know we're in a golden age of of television and streaming and you know at some point the streaming bubble is going to burst but right now there's just so much content so much great content because everyone's competing yeah. with each other you know and just yeah. to me and we got movies coming out on netflix that are now up for oscars i mean that's been the last year is that movies don't go to the theaters they go on television i watched the matrix on my tv because i was afraid to go into a movie theater with omicron so i just watched the new matrix on my sure. television i mean um yeah that's in, that's the incredible aspect of i mean just yeah you talk about all the different options people have now it's ridiculous like there are things yeah. that i will never even have heard of that lots of people watch religiously and i'm like what's yeah. that <laughs> That's a very good point too. That's also changed. I mean, there, there was a time when there was very little that we would go for that I'd never heard of, but yeah. now I don't even know what the heck we're talking about sometimes. <laughs> I mean, cause yeah. I'm like, I don't know this show. And then it's incumbent upon me to try to figure out a way to watch it. I mean, you need to get some kind of sense of it. 
Right. You right. Know, so if I get a show that I don't know, I go, okay, well, it's got to be on some streaming service. So then you're, <laughs> then you're on there going, okay, I remember when this week trial ends, so I don't have to pay for this because I got to check this show out. That's right. You know, here's a here's a little life hack. Yeah. Just get four different email addresses. And if you want to watch something, just do four different seven day trials Yep, <laughs> on the same, on the same thing. Well, that's I've how I've watched of, uh, series before. Yeah. That's, that's one way to do it. I've heard of another way where like people get some like visa credit cards or something. They got as like yeah. a gift one year at Christmas. Me has like 10 cents left on it. But you could still register it for one of these streaming yeah. platforms, get a trial. And then they just, you know, you don't have to cancel or anything. Cause they just, Oh, that's pretty good. Card. Yeah. That's pretty good. I'm sure they've come around some way to do that. I mean, yeah. they, they, a lot yeah. of them have found VPNs now. So yeah. I've always got to switch. Well, I've always got to switch my VPN location when I'm in Canada. Yeah. Well, I mean, and in the U S obviously there's, there's much more restrictions and probably in Canada and stuff as well. And in Europe, but like in other parts of the world, I mean, like Russia, for example, you can pretty much stream anything, you know, it doesn't matter. People have, you know, all these illegal websites, you now they're able right. to, to stream everything on. So, yeah. um, and until you know. Putin, until Putin says no, and it's political, it's, you know, it's can't right. do any Depending of that on the stuff. film. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, but it's, it's great too. Cause you know, I can watch, I grew up in Canada, so I can watch the Canadian Olympic coverage, Yep. you know, and all that stuff. But yeah, it's a, uh, that's also different because I don't know when geoblocking came in. I remember when we were doing Master and Commander in Mexico, we had a room with two computers. I mean, that's how long ago that was. We had a computer yeah. room they set up for us because none of us had cell phones that could go on the internet. And there was no geoblocking back then. Yeah. When did geoblocking come in? Like 2007? I can't remember. I mean, it seems like that could be a logical time it would come in. Um, I feel like, yeah, I feel like... A, it's been around for a while, so that that could make sense. Um, because it's always been an issue, I think, for watching different yeah. things. Um, you know, even today, if like people are trying to share their uh, like cable account or something like that, you could get blocked for like, oh, you know, you're not or like you if, you're too many. To, if you're trying to watch a football game and it's like a local game for the person that holds the account, yeah. um, and you're trying to watch it, you know, from some other state, you know, it's like, sorry, you can't watch it because it's supposed to be on, you know you know, cable television, not on the uh, app or something. Yeah, this is, you got to get a, you got a VPN. I did discover though, weirdly, if you go on cell data, like if you have an international plan in Canada where it's unlimited, the cell data gets past geoblocking for some reason. On Wi-Fi, yeah. I can't do Pandora. On cell That's data, I can, do pan, I can do Pandora in Canada, no problem. I'm not yeah. going to say which cell company because I don't want them to shut it down. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But Who it, is it? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> but it, I, it is weird because I had unlimited yeah. data. So there were times that I would just, and then now you can stream to your Apple TV without being on Wi-Fi, which I don't know when that started to happen. I travel a lot. Yeah. So I have a lot of these stupid hacks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, if you, if you stream from your iPad to your Apple TV on Hulu, you can get past all the commercials. There's no commercials when you do that weirdly. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Life I cover yeah. a lot of stupid stuff like that. So, <laughs> and ExpressVPN, not that I, I, I don't, I just, that's the one I use. And it seems to be the best one. Yeah. Sure. So, but so yeah. So like, that's, 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 yeah. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. You're fine. No, I was going to say that's like that, that's been part of the big changes, you know? Yeah. I so. feel like an, another big thing that's happening now is that uh, international productions, I mean, other languages are starting to get more mainstream in the U.S. and Canada. Um, I know, yeah. obviously, Squid Game became pretty popular. On Netflix, there's some Russian shows that became pretty popular, like Better Than Us. Yeah, um, I watched Ragnarok in Norwegian, which yeah. I think is great. You know, I mean, I think it's fantastic because it just, I think the more we can be exposed to, the better we're going to be. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, the, yeah. The more sense we get of, you know, all being, and what's interesting, too, is you realize it's all the same. Yep. You know, they all, they all have the same dreams and hopes that we have. Oh, sure. They yeah. just have it in a different language. Yep. Um, and so that's been, and that's been, because I mean, I'll choose to watch it. If I can, I would rather watch it um, subtitled in the, in the regular language than dubbed. <laughs> everything right. except, everything except for Attack on Titan. Okay. <laughs> which weirdly is so ridiculously good and has such weird writing that i love to listen to the actors try to do that in english i don't know if you've ever seen attack on titan no i haven't i'll have to check it's it out an, it's an anime thing on adult swim and it's just like that's the only one i prefer to watch because the writing is so what the hell <laughs> and then you i'm going how the hell are these guys doing this it's fascinating right. it's also changed a lot too is that we don't go into the rooms to audition anymore and this is a covid thing is where everything has now become self-taping 
Okay. Which yeah. means that we all, and this, this was starting to come a little bit more even before COVID because so many of the productions are not based in Los Angeles that, you know, they'd ask for us to tape it ourselves. Or we, would, we used to go into a casting office, do the initial read when you're getting started. So the cast director would get a general sense. Then they'd call you in for the general audition where, uh, or for a callback with like 10 or 12 other guys where the producers and directors would be there. And then that's, usually get a job there. Sometimes you have another step up for the bigger role. Yeah. That was starting to go away even two or three years ago because the producers aren't necessarily here. Um, so we would start going down to casting director's offices to put it on tape for them to, to read. Then they'd start asking us to tape it ourselves. So I started going, I don't want to drive for you know 15 miles right. to just put it on tape anyway. Sure. So I just we just started doing it here. But now everything is on tape which again has advantages and disadvantages. Um, we'll audition for stuff way ahead of time because the, the one advantage is that instead of just 12 people being up for it, they can literally open it up and bring in 75 tapes and get people that wouldn't have gotten a chance, get a chance to be seen. You know, the flip side of that is that, you know, something that's going to shoot in two months because they've got to do that, you know, we need it sooner than they would have gotten it before. I, when it first started in Vancouver, it was crazy. You'd be getting auditions on Monday. There were nine pages due tomorrow. Oh my God. You know, and it's just, it was just insane. And, you know, someone who's just starting out can't say no. You know, I had a little bit of thing where I'd go, I'm not going to do it. They can either wait or they can't. I just don't have time. And yeah. they would usually wait for me as opposed to someone who's just getting started. Um, and the nice thing, too, that I like about that is you can sort of choose what you want to send. You know, there's I, uh, part of it is like you had one shot and you just go on. I kind of like that. And you just, you know, they would just send that tape in and that's it. It's good that you can get a little in the weeds going, which one of these six takes that I just did for the last hour of my house is better. I don't know about it. And you, and you had to try to avoid doing that. You just got to, got to go. This is the essence. I'm going to send it. Right. So that's, that's, that's been one of the biggest differences is, you know, we can tape on our phones now. You know, it used to be camcorders when, I was, yeah. when we started doing this. I just taped my iPhone. Yeah, I mean, um, phones have gotten so sophisticated and the cameras are so good. Like, you hardly ever see yeah. people using an actual camera anymore. Uh, no. Unless you're a professional photographer, so. Yeah, and it's so funny, too, because, you know, when you would mime cameras, when I was in theater school, we'd mime this. Yeah. <laughs> now you're miming that. Right. And that's how much has changed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's uh, I just realized that because we, we would like mime and I'd be like pretending to be on camera doing this kind of stuff when I was in theater school. Now it's that. <laughs> so it's right. The, yeah. So. yeah, it's funny. So um, obviously you've been in the industry for a long time now. Um, you've been at, you know, lots of cool long roles, time. interacting with with all sorts of interesting people. It seems like you had a lot of fun. It's cool. Um you know, are there any kind of funny stories or, or really cool stories that you sort of take away the most when you look back at your career and you think like, you know, that was a, this was a really cool or funny moment or. Well, I mean, some of the cool moments were all Robin Williams moments and Ben sure. Stiller moments and literally yeah. just going, I can't believe that they just laughed at what I said. Right. Right. Um, getting, getting to fly to, to London and shoot there. I mean, getting to travel. Yeah. I mean, it sounds silly. The first time I was in one of those like lay flat bed pods was always pretty cool yeah i i do gotta say it was kind of nice i grew up in vancouver and to fly back for night at museum um to fly back to my hometown and realize i'm gonna be in a hotel in the city that i literally you know left a year ago yeah that was kind of a big that was kind of a cool moment you know they give you this little welcome package i'm like i don't need that thanks i know where the restaurants are right but that was that was a i mean it's that was a big moment for me because i'm like i'm flying back home you know, and, and, you know, and just to stay in, in the fancy hotel that everyone stays in when they come and shoot, when I would be there and I'd be a guest star and, you know, they'd be getting picked up at the Sutton place. And now I'm going to get picked up at the Sutton place. Yeah. And that was kind of, that was kind of cool. Um, I think it's mainly just meeting Mickey Rooney and Dick Van Dyke and the people I get to meet, you know, that's, sure. and some of the locations, a night music, this was a big one, night museum of three. We got to shoot in the British Museum. We got a special tour. But I realized that we would, what they call is go to ones, which is our first mark to start the scene. And yeah. they go back to ones. And I realized that our first mark was literally the Rosetta Stone. Ooh, okay. And I'm like, how often do you have the Rosetta Stone is where you go back to before you start this scene? And it was just, I mean, I'm going, this is incredible. 
Yeah. You know, I, that those are some of the big ones is being able to travel. I, I love London. I got to work in New York on night at museum. Um, you know, I get to work in Albuquerque and New Mexico now and travel. I think that's the thing I, I still get a big kick out of. It's a little bit harder as I'm getting older. It's not yeah. as much fun as it was. Hotels aren't quite the kind of, you know, exciting thing they once were. Yeah. Um, but I think it's that it's the people, you know, it's, it is that sort of giddy feeling of like, you know, I just made these really talented people laugh or that they somehow respect what I do or that I can be, you know, I can actually just actor to actor do something that, that adds to the scene with Ben Stiller or Robin Williams or Andre Brower. Or, right. And like, you know, that's, and that's just kind of cool. I mean, yeah. that's just really cool. So. Yeah. I mean, one of those things, I guess, especially when you talk about, you know, going back to Vancouver just shows how far you, you know, you've come one of those moments, you just look back like, wow, you know, I started here and now I'm coming back in this situation. That's pretty awesome. So It was, I mean, I had, I had what we call a lot of, they call them act roles in Canada under fives here. I had 20 of them, you know, I mean, I, I didn't have a care. I didn't have a named character. I think for my first 10 jobs, it was always like, started out as cop three or thug three. Then I worked up to thug two or cop two, Ooh, you know, yeah, then it'd be like cop one, you know, <laughs> and I, I would always call myself Frank. Okay. In my head, but uh, but I mean, I remember even then getting a, getting going, you know, move going from the actor roles with no names to a character named with a name. You know, then you get a character that comes back for more than one day. Then you get a character that comes back for more than one episode, and that's all like skills you've got to learn how to do. There's a big difference between playing a character on an arc of a sixty minute show, yeah. and then bringing back that character over ten or eight, ten or twelve episodes. Is you know, you have a lot more. I mean, you, you, you will inform what that character becomes much more. You have much more of an opportunity over a course of number of episodes to do that. So there's all that kind of stuff. I, there's a lot of milestones, for lack of a better term, yeah. that I look back on going, okay, I remember what that felt like. And every once in a while, what keeps me going is I get that feeling I had like in 96, 97, where it's just like just that feeling of just excitement or, or that's why I miss about being in the room because I'd, I'd see people in there who were in for smaller roles going, I remember, I remember exactly, I could feel exactly what right. I was thinking. I remember sitting there in Toronto in 1998 with that same kind of sense of excitement and fear mixed with like, what am I doing, which is, isn't as great. And that I still get that, which means, which makes me feel I like, because that means that, you know, I can do this for a much, much longer. Like I oh, said, yeah. once it once it becomes not fun or I lose enthusiasm, then that's a problem. I've had periods where I became bitter, and that's part of the reason I left Toronto. And that'll just kill you. Oh yeah, it'll just kill sure. you in this industry, you know. And so I've done a lot of work on, you know, trying to learn from my mistakes and just trusting too that the experience is just going to have an effect. It just is. Yeah. Now, I remember my first job ever. There was a guy who was about. God, he was, I thought he was so old, but he's my age now. And he was so good. And I remember going, I remember asking him, like, were you this good when you were my age? He goes, it's just experience. Just trust me. It's just experience. And, it, and he's right, because I'm there now. And it's, I'm a better actor now than I was even 10 years ago, simply by the fact of doing. It's like, a, I guess, like an athlete or a painter or anything. The more you do it, the better you get. Right. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, your career and all the things that you went through to get where you are today. Um, you know, obviously, I think that the interest in getting involved in the, the film and TV industry continues to be huge. There's still lots of people that want to do that, that, you know, grew up dreaming of being an actor. What advice would you have for people, you know, trying to do that? Do it. Just I do mean, it. I yeah, I mean, it's hard because I, you know, my experience in Canada, even 20 years ago, is hard for me to sort of, I don't understand the experience of starting in the States or coming to LA. I don't know how people right. do it. I have but respect for people that come here and do it. Um, I don't know if this applies as much as it did, but I still believe you should go to school if you can. Um, there's not as much theater. I still think that school, uh, those five years I spent in theater school, I think, were invaluable to me not just what you learn about acting because there's much more you can learn about acting than i thought you could i just thought it was all instinct but there's a lot of craft you can learn i still take classes now okay wow yeah. um yeah i had a i had a great teacher joe police who you know who 
he said once to us, he said, athletes practice every day. Our skill set is just as specialized. So if yeah. they're going to practice, why wouldn't me? Because right. there's nothing worse than getting paid for a job you can't do. Yeah. And I don't want to get a job that I can't do. So you go to class to try to learn how to get more emotion or try to learn to say, I'm not good at this. And you try to learn how to do right. it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I, if they want to do it, just, you got to love it. I mean, it's a really difficult industry. You're, they're going to tell you no a lot. Um, you just got to believe in yourself. And, and, you know, anybody they admire started exactly where they're starting. Yep, that's true. I mean, Meryl Streep did not come out of the womb and then be anointed. I mean, at one point, she'd never had a job. We all start never having had a job, you know. Um, I had another coach of mine say, let me figure this right. You can't believe you're entitled to it, but you should believe you deserve it, mm-hmm. you know. And, yeah. and to me, like, I, how you think about it. for me it's really important the words we use because we're i'm not entitled to it but i deserve to get I, I i deserve personally i have as much of a chance as anybody else right so just find your own niche i think there's a balance between understanding the restrictions of the business especially if you're um a minority or ethnic or anything there's going to be certain constraints in the business which you can't do anything about but you can also find a way to, to make what is perceived weakness a strength. I'm mixed race, yeah. which for a while could have been a weakness, but I just kind of went, you know what? It's a, I'm ambiguous. I'm not, I stopped telling people what I am in casting offices. You sure? And I, yeah. said, I'm not, I said, I'm not trying to be coy. I just don't want, you, you obviously, if you think I can play this, I don't want to influence you one way or the other. Right, right. Um, and just believe, I think the biggest thing is believing yourself. I mean, it really... I know everybody that I audition against. I know everybody that's my quote unquote competition. They're all damn good actors. Yeah. You know, why we get jobs, I don't know. I'm no more talented than anybody else. There's something about who we are is what they cast. And you need to believe in yourself. Just find as much possible truth as you can get. If you want to get down to brass tacks, nitty gritty, there is no right way to do it. If you're just starting out and you go audition, there's no right way to do it. There's the way you do it. Because they don't know what it is they want until they see it. Yeah, I mean, it's all about finding your truth. It kind of just sounds like, with, like, just with life in general, like you just take a path and you go where it leads and keep working towards that goal. And you just does your your path doesn't have to mimic someone else. It's your path. No, and, it's your path. Yeah, and like I said, you need to. Hear, I don't. I'm not one of those that thinks you don't hear knows. You don't have to listen to know. Right. You're gonna get know a lot. Yes, that's you know <laughs> part of the process. But, yeah, it's part of the process, you know, and um, I think you need to be, I don't have this very well. I've been quite fortunate in a lot of ways. You know, the one thing I wish I was more of was relentless and driven. There's nothing wrong with ambition. Um, I don't think, I think we need a strong ego as long as it's healthy. Yeah. You know, like I said, when you're in, this is a business in a bubble of bullshit on a layer of bullshit with more bullshit in a big bubble. Now, when you're in that bullshit bubble, fuck yeah, it matters what trailer we have. It matters how much money we're getting. It matters where our stupid credits are. Right. Absolutely. It just doesn't have anything to do with outside of real life. Yeah. You know, I'm no better than anybody else at the gas station. Maybe somebody might let me into a restaurant, you know, because they see me, but, which is all great, but doesn't mean I'm a better person. And I yeah. think once people need to realize that, you know, I get flat tires and no one, I have to fix it my damn self. Yeah. But at the same token, it, it, you need to understand that there are certain things in this business that are fun. And I think you have to play into them. I mean, at some point there's going to be a time when you come on set and they're going to say, well, breakfast over there, you can go get it. And all of a sudden you've got a bigger part. They're going to ask you what you want. You can't say, don't worry about it. I'll go get it. You just say, thank you. I'll take this because they have said, this is how this is working. And you've got to be where you are. If you kind of underplay yourself or undersell yourself, I think it's just as bad as overplaying or overselling yourself or overvaluing sure. yourself. So it's like it's that a- little thing in Price is Right, that little range game with a red. Uh, you, had to get, you had to guess the price within a certain amount. Yeah, I know what you're talking kind of about. I don't know what, the, what it's called exactly. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's called the range game. And you know, the, I think my biggest issue was not, was I getting, was always undervaluing myself, not overvaluing. Yeah. You know? So that's my advice is just, you got to love it. You got to love it. And there's also nothing wrong 
at all. I've, I've seen this happen a lot when I'm in class with friends of mine. At some point, if you decide it's not what you want to do, there's no shame. Right. Right. You know, there's no, you know, there's no shame in it at all. If, just if you're going to decide to, to stop doing it, do it on your terms. Don't do it because you're influenced by anybody else. Don't yeah. keep doing it because you're influenced by anybody else or you feel like you need to. It's a lonely, 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 lonely business. It really yeah. is just us. And then, yeah. you know, we have to bring ourselves to a team, but ultimately it comes down to us. So yeah. follow your gut. That's the biggest one. Follow your damn gut. Yeah, and I use think, this a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> that makes sense to me. It sounds like it's it's just all about perspective and and being you know having a healthy balance of, of your outlook on you know what you're doing and what you're trying to do and not getting yeah. uh, you know too negative about things and, and and the other thing is realize how much time you have. That's the other thing too. Is that you know people who were 45 when I was 25 would be trying to say. You have so much time because when you're just young and getting started, you feel like I got to get this now. And if I haven't got this in a year, I failed. And they're so right. And some, I understand people aren't going to really understand it, but it, it is true. When you're 25 years old, you have so much time. You don't right. need it all now. You know, that's, it's again, it's part of appreciate where you are. Yeah. You know, it's not, it is no small feat to get any kind of a job in this business. I think people need to realize you've, there were 700 people that were put out for it. There were hundred yep. people that were looked at. They're not just giving a small part that somebody chose you. Doesn't mean you have to be happy with three lines, but understand that's something to be proud of. They chose you to do that. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. You know? And so just remember that and then you'll be okay. And that's how you get to thug two and then thug one and then Frank <laughs> move up the ladder. <laughs> yeah, because that, that took me, that was the source of my bitterness. That's what I had to learn is to go, you know what? I don't have to be satisfied. I don't have to settle for this, but I'm damn satisfied and damn proud and go, wow, this is a big deal. There's a lot of damn people. I, I sat beside the guy in an airplane that does breakdown services, puts them together. And he was telling me the numbers, like they'll put up a thousand people, you know, and then the cast directors will break that down to, a hundred and then they'll break that down to 12 and then they'll break that down to two and then they'll break that down to one and they do that for every part they're not literally just randomly giving the two-line barista you've earned that part and as long as you always remember that i think you're going to be okay yeah no that's that's great advice especially because i feel like for a lot of people that are probably even if they're somewhat interested in becoming an actor they might feel like oh if you don't have connections you know you're never going to make it there's no chance um and then they just, because of that, they're like, oh, okay, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to try. But I mean, I think your path is a good example of that where you just, you know, just work your way up. Um, work your you just got to go for it. So, yeah. And we all have no connections. You get connections by starting. Yeah. And then right. you get connections and then you actually yeah. get, I mean, that's a lot of the business is yeah. they like you, they're going to hire you. They're going to hire someone they know and like, or if it's, if, if all things are equal, which they are in terms of talent in this business, they're going to hire the person they know and like they've worked with before. That's connections. Yeah. Just go for it. We all start right. in the same damn place. Yeah. We all yeah. literally start with no jobs. Yeah. But take training. Um, trust yourself. And like I said, it's this weird balance of, of going your own path, but also listening to people that know, yeah. you know, you're going to have agents and managers, you know, uh, and you have to find the balance. You know, sometimes they know more than you do and your instincts may not be serving you best. It doesn't mean they're not right. But sometimes you may have to go, you know what? I, I hear what they're saying. This is what I really want to do. And it, that, that's just a personal um, situation, a situational thing. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that was the difficult stuff for me is to kind of go find the balance between my guts all saying this, but. And it took me a while to kind of go, okay, you know what? They're right. Maybe I should just chill the hell out here. Or, or maybe I can do that that I don't think I can do. Yeah. Um, so that's part of it too, is, is take advice from the people that know. But at the same token, all your gut. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, that's good advice for trying to pursue a career in really anything. I mean, it's just, yeah. that's all you could do. So It really is. I mean, honestly, it is like anything else. We just get seen by people and we're very fortunate to be able to do it right but you know it is it is a, it is a job have a real life if you can have a have a life outside of it don't make it your life right it's a job it's yeah. a damn good job but it's a job
what are you currently working on? Uh, I know you're in a couple new shows with, with you know Big Sky, and uh, but are there any things that like haven't come out yet that you're like in the process of? Or yeah, so Big Sky, I'm on the Joe Pickett is only on Spectrum right now, so that should come on a Paramount Plus in a few months. Um, I was fortunate enough to get I think four or five episodes of a. I think I can say this. Oh, yeah, sure. Of a Netflix series that's based on feudal Japan. Oh, okay. So that should come out. That should come out soon. Um, cool. I just got an animation film, which I probably can't talk about, but I'm really happy with that because animation films are really hard to get. Yeah. Okay. Really, really difficult because that's, that's another thing where it's been taken by the big stars. Oh, you wow. Know? Okay. So television, we can still get it, but it's all big names. So. Well, thanks so much for coming on. And it's, it's really cool for you to share all your experiences. And uh, yeah, so it's been really fun. Oh, it was fun. And thanks for doing the podcast. I really enjoy the stuff you do. I mean, it was really fascinating. Uh, awesome. You I know. appreciate it. I appreciate it.